Yeah, I'm Eric Levan. I am a doctor in music and literature as well, and I am a classical concert pianist and have been teaching literature for a number of years as well. Oh, there are many similarities between literature and music, particularly in the structure. There are certain writers who modeled their own music or their own literary works after musical structures. For example, James Joyce and uh, the French writer Flaubert. Some of the structures that they employed in their literary works are, have parallels in music as well. Yes, well, uh, we did separate tasks to a certain extent, although there was quite a bit of overlap as well. Um, I was in charge of the musical education, primarily, and also, uh, to a large extent, the literary section of their educational endeavors. They were big readers from the time they were very young, and I cultivated, I, I, at least I hope I did, cultivated a great love for literature early on and therefore it was almost an easy task to continue in that way because there was never any sort of coercion about reading. They read voluntarily on their own. And as a result, you know, um, instead of memorizing vocabulary lists and so on, they had quite a vocabulary and a sense of style early on because they were reading good authors from an early age. And uh, I just remember the uh, younger daughter, she achieved a perfect score in the, in the, on the SAT uh, in the uh, literary section. And she, she didn't study for it in a traditional sense. She, she just had that knowledge from years of reading and analyzing literature. Well, first of all, reading the great writers is a way to be in the company of some of the most interesting, imaginative, and creative minds in the history of mankind. We engage with them during the course. We relish their unique use of language, an unusual turn of phrase. We learn to notice and ask why they choose this particular descriptive detail and not another. We begin to understand how this specific detail, for example, the half-mocking smile on the Sphinx in H.G. Wells' story, The Time Machine, fits into the structure of the whole story. We begin to understand that a great writer never leaves anything to chance, but that in a masterpiece of literature, every detail, every event has a purpose and has its important place in the overall structure of the story. And I mentioned earlier the similarities between musical structure and literary structure. We also understand that a writer of talent will imagine in his or her mind's eye the descriptive detail of the story, inviting us to see for ourselves the vivid picture he has painted through words. So we enter together into this imaginary world created by the writer, a world made believable, plausible, through the use of descriptive detail. One of the great lessons that a student can acquire by exploring the great works of fiction is to learn how to notice, how to discern those things that usually go unnoticed. Although practiced in a fictitious world of the story, the attentive student will see that this newly acquired ability of discernment works in our real world as well. The critical faculty is sharpened and we begin to perceive connections that we never saw before. In my teaching, I encourage my students to make such connections. I point out the secret inner workings of the story, of the structure, and how they are held together by astute clues. This brings me to another point about the fiction we will be studying. Although the stories we will be reading are make-believe, and the events the author describes is not reality, as we see it, it's not our reality, a great work of fiction may mold the emotions and distill or reveal truths and realities more real, more true, than any we could readily discern in ordinary life or in a work of nonfiction. 
certain truths become clearer and more cogently presented within a work of fiction. For example, the idea of alienation, of the dichotomy between our inner life and our physical exterior, the theme of the outcast, all of these notions are rendered strikingly clear in a novel such as Kafka's Metamorphosis, whose protagonist undergoes an inexplicable transformation into a verminous insect. Or, in H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, much of the story unfolds 800,000 years in the future, where the time traveler is confronted with a world that shatters all of our expectations of progress and the destiny of man. The questions that the main character asks himself are ones we might or should question about our own world, our present world. What does progress really mean? Is it possible to devolve, to regress, to go backwards as a civilization, as a species, if we disregard the accumulated knowledge of the past? If we become complacent and unfeeling towards our fellow man? Or we learn the genre of the fable in Vladimir Nabokov's short story, The Dragon. The fairy tale in it reveals much about the triteness of commercial advertising and how modern life can take away the enchantment and mystery within the world. In sum, in reading together masterpieces of literature, we enter into an alternate world of fiction of the imagination, a parallel reality. In this parallel fictive reality, we learn to exercise discernment, to think critically, to notice detail, and how such detail is related to the whole. But equally important is that we learn through our readings to refine our feelings, to understand how a character might be emotionally relating towards another. We learn to empathize with the inner life of a character. In so doing, we train our own thoughts and sentiments. We also develop an appreciation of the quintessentially American humor of such authors as Mark Twain. There we dissect the idiomatic expressions and forms of language that make his brand of writing unique. So, in my approach to teaching literature, I regard the novels and stories we will be reading as art and examine the works in this way. I want my students to enjoy literature in much the same manner we appreciate a piece of music or a painting by a great master. We learn to distinguish between the significant and the trivial. We discuss why this passage is particularly insightful and masterfully written and why it is poetic and not commonplace. We learn the richness of the language and the multitudinous variety of vocabulary. We observe why this writer chose a particular word and not another. Everybody in my class will bring a simple notebook in which to write down unfamiliar vocabulary. Each work we study will have its own vocabulary list. From my experience, a student's vocabulary is significantly expanded using this method. We retain new words best when they are learned in a particular context. Our memory works best when a word is associated with a vivid image or situation. Such an approach is more effective than simply memorizing lists of vocabulary. In sum, my main goal is to stimulate the students to become good and lifelong readers. We often think in terms of practical results. How much vocabulary will the student learn? How well will he or she do on standardized tests? How well will the student be prepared for college? These are all legitimate concerns and goals. And my courses will, I have no doubt, help the students in meeting these concerns and attain these goals. But the greatest gifts I can hope to give to my students is a love for literature and a desire to continue on that adventure of literary discovery. We achieve the best in those things that we love. We keep going back to them. If a young student develops this desire for reading quality literature, 
then all of the sought out benefits naturally will stem from that desire. The student expands his vocabulary, he learns to formulate cogent and elegant sentences, he develops a sense of style in his writing, he learns how to construct a naturally flowing narrative. I am convinced that if the student imbibes enough of the writing from the very best, there can be no better instruction for becoming a very good or excellent writer himself. I have to say some very, very good success in that way. Certain students who came to me and the, the parents said, he doesn't like reading. And when we started approaching, we read the time machine, we started, and then the desire for reading grew. And I think it's just the way that we approached it and the way that we, we discussed it together and discovered it as an adventure that we were doing at the same time. And I've seen very good results in that matter. Well, there are several considerations. One is the question of length. Since we want to cover a decent amount of literature with a certain variety of styles and authors, I cannot choose a novel which is too long because that would take up perhaps half of the sessions. So uh, most of the works are either novellas, short novels, or short stories. The other consideration is that we are dealing with young readers, so the typical story of a novel has to do with romance and uh, marital life, etc. Those stories, although they, they may be masterpieces such as Tolstoy's Anna Karenina or you might have uh, Madame Bovary by Flaubert, we won't approach those. I tend to choose masterpieces such as Kafka's Metamorphosis which younger readers can best relate to and that we can discuss well in class. Also, I don't like the term science fiction, but H.G. Wells, for example, The Time Machine, some consider Wells to be the inventor of science fiction, although he was much more than that. I personally consider that he was a writer of the highest rank, one of the greatest in English literature, and he was a fantastic novelist, and his novels are not well known. But in a story such as A Time Machine, it's much, much more than science fiction. It goes beyond that. And I think I touched upon some of the reflections and the uh, repercussions that that story has in our understanding of our reality. The fact of imbibing the writing style of the very best there's a, there is a certain osmosis that goes on. I mean, we, there's, there's no other way really to learn good style and good clarity and elegance in writing unless you are very familiar with the best. And, of course, I do present the best writers, in my opinion. And the fact that we're going to not simply read it, but we're going to analyze, we're going to understand what makes this particular sentence better than saying it a different way and what makes it particularly elegant what makes it particularly beautiful and by the fact of, of reading a certain quantity of literature I do see the results in the writing of the students when they do samples and I will have some of the students write texts for me based on questions my main concern is that they imbibe that they understand thoroughly the works we are, we are reading I'm not going to consider general questions and ideas, which is so often done in literary courses. I'm not so interested in the general ideas because anybody can present a general idea. I want the specific idea, the specific detail, the, what makes this particular writer specific and what makes him unique. And in so doing, we start to understand why this particular style is different from another. Wells' style is so significantly different from that of Kafka. Even though Kafka is in translation, Kafka has a very laconic, dry, rather scholarly, academic style, which is intentional. His writing is based on scientific writing. And the, this, this writing works extremely well and effectively in the story he's, he is projecting because the uh, subject matter is so outrageous and so fantastical and yet it's described in such a clear 
in almost, as I said, scientific manner. Wells is very rich in his vocabulary, very vivid, tiger bright in his literary style. So we will we'll discuss the distinctions between the styles and we, we will be able to, in a sense, in, through that discernment, incorporate some of these stylistic elements into our own forms of writing and our own samples.